This is Clarence. Which do we want more? Or do we want snowmobiles, money, four-wheel drive vehicles? Or do we want to carry on hunting caribou? And it's pretty clear they can't do both. They've got to choose between more development, the money that it's going to bring, you know, the higher standard of living that that's going to bring, or, and at the same time as they choose that, that means kissing goodbye to a lot of the natural processes that underlay the lives that they used to have. You see the evidence of climate change in tiny oh, ways. Oh, what? There's water. Is there? Global warming is having the same effect on us. You know, it's as we as we embrace technology, as the industrial revolution, you know, occurred from the mid 19th century onwards. It transformed our lives, and now it turns out it was transforming the planet as well. Dealing with the cause of it would mean recognizing that all the things that we've grown up to value, having lots of stuff, having cars, owning things to be happy, being wealthy, you know, the, the, what fundamentally makes us modern people is also what's threatening the future of the planet. You know, that's a big realization. It is very clear that we are seeing warning signs that we neglect at our peril. This is Lord Oxborough, chairman of Shell. We are going to see probably a world in which calamities, famines, um, great loss of life, big storms, much more common. And I think, uh, as global citizens, we need to do something about this. I can't believe he just said that. From where I'm coming from, I've been talking to scientists, they've been making these dire predictions about global warming, that the planet's heating up. There's scenarios where if we don't do something about carbon emissions, by the end of this century, we're going to reach a place where we've, we're in irreversible climate change and right. do things to our planet that are unprecedented. Right. So, so it's, it's, it's emergency time. We have to start thinking of... Oh, is it as way... bad as that? Well, that? well, yeah, if you believe the scientists. Yeah, is it as bad as that? I'm starting to think it is. Right. Would you have one in your back garden? I don't have a back garden, so... so I was answering the question. Um, would I have one in my back garden? I, I guess I probably would. I, right. I guess I probably would. Yeah. Well, which one do you want? <laughs> the only environmentalist I met who acknowledged the reality of the situation was this man, James Lovelock, whose theory of the planet as a single organism called Gaia, revolutionized the earth sciences and made him a guru for the Greens. The sea level is going to rise if we don't do something about it, almost certainly, to anywhere between 7 and 14 metres. And this will take out nearly all the major cities of the world. There will be refugee problems on a scale that we've never, ever seen before. The total death toll could reach a billion. And it, it's the hugest disaster that's ever confronted our species. What about new sources of energy or using renewable resources? There's all sorts of nice ideas which would be fine if we had 50 years or 100 years, like sequestering the carbon dioxide as it comes out of the chimneys, building tidal schemes, using wind power properly in the places where it would be suitable things like that, but we don't have time. And the only energy scheme that I know of that is immediately or almost immediately available and could provide large amounts of energy quickly without doing anything to the greenhouse is nuclear. Would you advocate that as a real alternative? It's not so much an alternative, it's a bandage, it's a therapy. Radiation therapy, if you like. Uh, we're in a hell of a mess and the only way out is to take, is to get uh, use nuclear power. When I was a teenager, I was, in, you know, I was in favour of CND, and to, uh, at that time, it seemed to me that being in favour of nuclear power was a bit like being in favour of nuclear war. T to me, the idea, nuclear technology is the opposite of environmentally friendly. It, it has got this produces this byproduct which remains radioactive for a quarter of a million years. It, it's got potentially devastating impact on the environment and yet produces no carbon emissions. You know, I, when the first time that was explained to me, I almost did a double take. People have just got to realise, there is just no question, uh, nuclear accidents 
will happen, but they're trivial compared with what's going to happen. It's like comparing a few car accidents with a war. This tree is actually growing out of the floor of what used to be the Pripyat volleyball gymnasium. And I guess this tree symbolizes the fact that it's not nature that needs defending, it's us. But how many people, how many people died because of Chernobyl? 100,000. You think maybe 100,000 additional deaths? For instance, 100,000 additional deaths in the Soviet Union. From cancers and... From Chernobyl, because of Chernobyl. 100,000 sounds like a lot, but that's a, that's not a, a lot, guess. Not a lot. Do you know how many people killed every year in the world by car accident? No idea. I think much more higher. You know, people want to have safe solutions. People want to be safe. OK, very well. Please, don't produce any other energy. No, no energy. Why? To be safe. Because I can explain very quickly. All of type of energy producing create some risk. Risk of uh, empty of uh, natural resources, risk of radionuclides release from nuclear power plant, risk of uh, water ecological changes in the case of hydrological electricity. So all of us create risk. In this case, to be safe, forget about everything. He's saying pr progress is painful and that there's nothing that has no, there's nothing that has no risk. He's right. Are you ready for this? No. <laughs> People call this progress. Progress. So otherwise, our society go to progress. As I forget about this and be safe. It's the most thankless. It's, in, it's it an is. evangelical task. Um, in some ways, um, it, but it can be done in, in a way which I think you know. It's not about sacrifice. It's about a very positive set but of it outcomes. It is about sacrifice, isn't it? It's about. Well, it's I about, say it's so. about saying you know what we'll we'll do with a bit less. I don't have your faith that human nature is so perfectible that people are going to be able to say you know what. This new car isn't making me happy after yes. all. I think I'd rather do Tai Chi in the park. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, it just seems like that our whole worldview is set up. It, we encourage people to consume. That's where we think the good yes, life lies. we do right now. And that's one of the things that we have to change. I've come to have a look at the fastest growing economy on the planet. Over a billion Indians are set to triple their carbon emissions in 20 years' time. When I arrived in the Bay of Bengal, I had no inkling that within a couple of months this part of the world would be hit by a tsunami that would claim over 150,000 lives. You think that's the way it's been continuing and will continue. Finally, we'll end up with our backs to the wall and then there's nothing else to progress, nothing else to do. We just stand and wait for death. But the harder they work to drag themselves out of poverty, the more certain they are of bringing about their own destruction. The economy here is expanding at an almost unbelievable rate. At present, an average American produces 20 times as much carbon as an average Indian. But all that is set to change. This is my microwave oven. I've just purchased it two years back. This is a small little mini fridge which I've got. This is my music system. It's a Panasonic music system. And this is my television. It's an LG television too. And that is about it. This is my little room and my little family. This is Sumit, part of India's booming middle class. Next year, Sumit's going to buy his first car. Big car? OK, big hundo. Yeah. The terrifying thing is, 50 million other Indians will soon follow suit. I don't know. What, what, about, what about this rickshaw? Why don't we take that? Which one? The guy, the bicycle guy. You want to go on the rickshaw? Well, I don't know. Why not? I don't want to sit on the rickshaw. You want to sit on the rickshaw? You want to sit with me? Well, yeah, I don't mind. Okay. Before we left, Sumit took us to meet the boss of one of the call centres where the UK shift was just starting up. You're calling BT and BT's charging you 130 pence a minute. But we are charging you only 64 pence. This is going to sound like a weird question, but how many cars do you drive? 
How many cars do you have, personally? I have four. You're talking about a billion people ready to work and ready to work seriously and educated people at that. India and China are going through a period of unprecedented economic growth. If this is powered through fossil fuels, you can kiss any idea of controlling global warming goodbye. But altogether, the impact is enormous. And in a way, the choice is quite simple. Either we switch them off, or we get nuclear power stations in our back gardens. But which politician wants to tell you that?